know our whole mission around here at this church is to point others to Jesus. And what better time to do that than the Christmas season? And uh, we want to talk to you this morning about something to see in the nativity scene. You have looked around, uh, you know, through the years. You've seen things and heard things and experienced things at Christmas that are very memorable, haven't you? And just like for me, I suspect for you this morning, um, I walked in and, and seeing the, the decor and uh, smelling the evergreen out in the lobby and the hot chocolate, and then to sit down on the front row there in the first service and to hear these Christmas songs, it takes me back. There are certain things that I remember, and, and maybe it's a school play or something that we did at church or a song that we sang somewhere, you know, in a, a congregational gathering someplace. I just have all these different memories about different experiences that I've had as a child growing up at Christmas and then as an adult and, and raising our own family. We've looked around and there's been so many different things that have happened. But every time when we revisit all that in the, in the fall and in the month of December, it always takes our hearts and our minds back to other places and reminds us of where we've traveled before. Thank you. I've uh, brought along a nativity set here that um, is one of my fond memories. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, we would decorate the home with Christmas uh, things. And, and um, I'll be honest, I wasn't much on the lights. I didn't care for doing the tree. I didn't like the bulbs. Um, but I, I enjoyed putting up the nativity scene. Uh, we had a little, uh, well, I shouldn't say little, it was big old console television uh, back in the day. And uh, try setting this thing up on top of your TV now, you know, if you can do it. Um, won't work, but uh, I had one, we had one as a family that was similar to this. Maybe it wasn't quite so big. And um, I remember the, every year unwrapping the different um, characters, the animals, um, taking out the nativity set. Ours had a little cutout, I think, there, and I had one of those little seven-watt bulbs in the back that we would turn on to illuminate inside and, and draw attention to it. But whenever we see these scenes, whenever we hear these songs, whenever we experience some of these things at Christmas, it takes us back. And I want to tell you this morning, there's something that I want you to see in the nativity scene, not just today, but in this month of December throughout the Christmas season. Uh, most of us have seen this scene before. Uh, you saw it out in a neighborhood, uh, maybe it was on a church lawn someplace, maybe you've seen it on a courthouse lawn in days gone by, maybe in some places still, maybe you've had it in your own front yard, the, the nativity scene. Um, the one I remember most, though, was that one on our, on our television, and every time I see one, it reminds me of that. Uh, you've seen it on Christmas cards, on billboards, on television, and um, if you're not careful, here's what I want us to guard against this Christmas. Don't let this scene fade into the background this Christmas. Don't let the nativity scene fade into the landscape. Uh, this morning as we prepare our hearts for Christmas, I want us to, to, to spend some unrushed moments uh, looking at this familiar Christmas scene. And I want you to notice three specific things that might be easy to overlook if we're not careful. First, I want to focus on the star. Now, I brought along a picture of a star because we know the star is a key part of the Christmas story, and it's not easy maybe for craftsmen to depict in the nativity scene, but the star was a key part of the Christmas story. And it points out the fact that God provides a travel guide for seekers. When you see a star this Christmas, I want you to think about that star, and it symbolically provides a travel guide for seekers. The Bible tells us that God commissioned a particular star to kind of serve as a travel guide for a group of men who traveled from the east and who had developed an interest in being able to come and see the Christmas child. Not only did that star lead these easterners to Jerusalem and then on to Bethlehem, but Matthew 2 tells us that the star led the wise men to the exact location where Mary and Joseph and Jesus were staying, which was not in a stable by that time, it was in a house. They finally located Jesus, and the scripture says, they fell on their knees and they worshiped him, and they gave him costly gifts. This uh, might have been, we don't know for sure, but this might have been as much as two years after the birth of the baby Jesus, that they found him and his mom and dad there in that house. 
Matthew chapter 2 talks about the, the wise men and the star. It says, after they'd heard the king, they went on their way, and that star that they'd seen in the east, it went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And I love this next line. Verse 10 says, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. I hope that when you see the star on top of a Christmas tree or depicted somehow this Christmas season, I hope you'll be overjoyed as you think about its significance, perhaps in a new way. Verse 11, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. Uh, the wise men, the text tells us clearly that they were remarkably overjoyed with this amazing travel guide that God had provided to them. Uh, they never would have found Jesus without that star. Some estimate that the wise men traveled over 900 miles across a very rough terrain to be able to come and see the Christ child. It'd be tough to do that without a GPS. I mean, most of us wouldn't even want to think about that. But God gave them a GPS and that star, and that Christmas star was God's gift to those who were looking for Jesus. The star is what gave them direction. It truly was God's guide for, for those seekers. And it still is the truth today is, as you look at that Christmas star, I want you to think about that. I, and maybe this will be a little different than you've ever considered before. But as you look at that star and see it as a symbol of the fact that God has always, God has always provided these travel guides to earnest spiritual seekers. That's the truth. I mean, throughout history, God has seen to it that those who diligently search for him, they will find him. Always. He will make it so. He, he'll do everything he can to make sure that those who seek him will find him. I believe that in a room this size, uh, there are people, many people, that are dedicated Christian folks. You, you've made a decision to follow Christ, and you've followed that decision, maybe some of you for many years, maybe most of your life, and you've been following, and you're going to continue to follow him. And um, as you look back on your life, if you're a Christ follower today, I want you to think about that time when you were just getting interested in spiritual things. Maybe it was back when you were a kid, or maybe when you were a teenager, or very early in adulthood. You're just kind of getting started, and, and as you began to ask some questions, you were a little confused, maybe, uh, didn't know for sure. You were feeling lost, but you didn't know quite what to do with all that. Maybe you were overwhelmed as you started trying to sort things out spiritually. In situations like that, I, I want to point out that God always provides a travel guide. Somebody to just kind of come along and help you and answer some questions and lead you to Christ. I'm sure we could hear lots of different stories today from different ones about the travel guides that God has placed in your life. Could have been a parent. Maybe it was a co-worker or a neighbor, a teacher. Maybe it was your pastor. Could have been a friend. Could have been any number of people that God used them as a travel guide in your life. But most Christians, we can retrace our spiritual steps and say, you know what, without this particular person, and there's a name and a face that comes to mind maybe for many of you, but without this particular person, you know, I don't know where I would be today. I, I don't know how I would have found Christ. But God was faithful, and he brought somebody across your path at just the right time in just the right way to point you to him. And I want us to thank God for that. Somebody whose light was bright, whose love was real, and whose faith was so compelling that you found yourself trusting that earthbound travel guide to help lead you and point you the way to Jesus. What would your life look like today if it had not been for their influence? What would your life be like today if you hadn't listened to what they said? Where would you be? What would you be doing? had it not been for that earthbound star that God used as a travel guide in your life. If you're a Christian, wouldn't today be an appropriate time, or wouldn't this Christ, Christmas be an appropriate time for you to begin to think about ways you could just stop and thank God for those travel guides? And, and why not take a minute and just assign a name to that star or those stars that God provided in your life to lead you from confusion to Christ. I'm also aware that uh, there may be some who feel a whole lot more like somebody who's still seeking than somebody who'd say, you know what, I have found. You're not there yet. 
but you've been seeking. And I suspect there are some who maybe feel like you're wandering in spiritual circles like we talked last Sunday, and, and maybe you don't feel like you're making much headway in your spiritual life right now. In fact, uh, there would be some probably that would say, I'm about as spiritually detached this year as I was last year, if I'm going to be honest. And maybe you would say, not only that, but I'm probably suspecting that next year I'm going to be about as spiritually detached as I am this year because I don't really see that much is going to change. For those of you who are still seekers, I want to give you a little word of encouragement to just look around in your life. Just look around at the people in your life. Chances are good that God has already placed some travel guides in your life somewhere. If you were to scan the horizons of your relationship, you probably already know someone whose spiritual light is burning brightly. There's something that is compelling about them, something that has drawn you to them along the way. And and when you stop and think about it, it's their faith that has caught your attention more than once. What if, what if that person is God's gift to you right now? I mean, in a way, he or she may be a sort of star in your life. They're like a travel guide for you, lighting the way to Jesus. The amazing thing is God can use whatever he wants. He can use whoever he wants to point the way to his son. And for these wise men, he used a star, a celestial guide, a travel guide. For some of us, he may have used or may decide to use a spouse or a co-worker or your child or your parent, a neighbor, a friend, who knows what, I would just say be open. Be open because there are stars who like the way to Christ. And these wise men, they were responsive to the guidance God provided for them. I just want to encourage you to be thankful too for those travel guides in your life. Maybe to drop them a note. I mean, just say thank you. Maybe make a phone call if it's possible. They may be gone now, but but to just let them know what they mean to you. See, sometimes the key to spiritual progress is in seeking out that travel guide and finding the answers to the questions that have been on your mind. You've done that, or maybe you're doing that. Be thankful for those travel guides. And, And there may be some here today, too, that I just feel compelled to say you need to consider how God might be calling you. How God wants to use you to help another. He wants you to light the way for another to find their way to Christ. That could be a key to your own spiritual progress where God has placed people in your life for a reason. And it's time for you to help light the way so that they can experience the peace that you've found this Christmas. I know we get a little bit wigged out about that and get all nervous about it. And I don't know what to say and I don't know what to do. All we do is witness and we shine the light. We tell what we know, what we've seen, what we've experienced. And every person in this room can do that. And so be open to being a travel guide for others that God may have brought into your path. I hope you'll take some time to identify those travel guides that God's already placed in your life. And if you've not already made a commitment to Christ... My prayer is that you get on the road and stay on the road to finding him, no matter what that takes. Look for the star this Christmas. The second thing I want to encourage you to do and and what I want you to see in this nativity scene is the stable. This is a picture of the stable, and uh, the stable symbolizes the fact that God sent Jesus to live in the real world. God sent Jesus to live in the real world. Um. When we look at this stable, um, the rough sawn hut that stable makers put together for our nativity sets sometimes looks so quaint. But being born in a stable is anything but quaint. Stables are crowded with smelly animals. Stables are dark and they're damp and they usually are rodent infested. And um, when you look at the stable, And you think about what that would mean. Even even a picture like this is fairly pristine. But if you were to place yourself there in that setting, every single one of us would say, that's a terrible place to have a baby. I don't know if any of you ladies that have given birth would say, you know what, that would be ideal. I mean, that's just perfect. Nothing like having a little, uh, you know, cow patty next to you and laying in a pile of straw and and the smells and the sights and just all of it. It would be... It'd be ugly, which makes a person ask, if God could commandeer a star 
to serve as a travel guide, don't you think he could have secured a room down at the, you know, Jerusalem Hilton or maybe even just the Jerusalem hospital, even if it's just a county hospital, let me, I'll go there, you know, even if it's a urgent care, I mean, just some place, God could have given him any place but a stable, but I think it's important that God could have provided a suite, he could have made it a whole lot better, but I believe God made a deliberate choice, and there may be lots of reasons why he did it, but when God sent his son to live on earth, he, he made a strategic decision, I believe, not to shelter him from the harsh realities of this life. Because the point is, Jesus came to live in the real world. God had no intention of shielding his son by having him be born into this make-believe world of the rich and famous. I think he must have wanted his son to experience life in all of its blue-collar boldness, man. Just get right out there with it, right where the people live. Jesus' first breath on this earth, it was probably filled with the smell of livestock, if you know what I mean. His uh, first experience of hearing noise with his ears, he would have heard the grunts of nearby animals. And his uh, first outfit was probably made of rags. See, from day one, God the Father determined not to shelter his son from the rude, crude realities of life here on planet earth. He didn't do that. Why? What was the purpose? I believe it was part of the fact that he wanted to point, hey, Jesus came for all mankind. He's here for all of us. I mean, if the Son of God had been born into the halls of the famous or the home of, a, of the wealthy aristocrat, most of us couldn't relate. But the bottom line is, nobody gets left out on a stable. Nobody. None of us have to feel left out. I mean, I, I want to invite you to take a long look when you see the stable this Christmas. Because the stable is a permanent reminder of the fact, it is a symbol of the fact that God sent Jesus to live in the real world. The real world where you and I live. He had no advantage. I mean, I suppose he had more humble beginnings than any person hearing this message. I mean, it doesn't get much worse than that. He was born into a real family that had a, he had a real construction job until the time he was about 30. He lived in a neighborhood he had real friends, you know, and he suffered hardship just like the rest of us. You know, there was some ebb and flow and some ups and downs in life that he faced, and then it started to kind of snowball, and things got worse, and we know that he was falsely accused, and he died a cruel death for a crime he didn't commit. See, no matter what you're going through, I think it's fair to say that Jesus knows your pain. He knows and he understands because he's been there. I mean, when you talk about life without advantage, he lived it. There's no question about that. Discrimination and oppression. Jesus was a refugee before his first birthday. Rejection. Maybe you're feeling rejected today and you just think, how could anybody know? Jesus knows. He experienced it. Ridicule, people talking behind your back, people putting you down. It was a part of his daily life. Abandonment. Nobody experienced abandonment on the level like Jesus did. I mean, here it was, it was his most critical time of need, his greatest hour of need, and he was abandoned by his closest friends. He experienced the death of loved ones again and again, and, and physical pain, when it comes to that, there's nobody that could hold a candle. None of us will ever experience the pain that he did in our lifetime. Whatever you experience in this life, whatever it is that may drive you to your breaking point, whatever you experience that hurts you the most, whenever you feel like quitting and crying and calling out and saying nobody understands, I want you to look at the stable and be reminded this Christmas that Jesus Christ gets it. Jesus Christ understands. He gets it. He, he feels your pain. He's been there. And he can identify with you no matter what you're going through today. And you matter to him more than you could ever imagine. I want you to see just how important the stable really is. I mean, it was no accident. I'm convinced of that. It symbolizes the deliberately unsheltered life of Jesus. And it stands as a monument to his ability to identify and sympathize with whatever you're going through today. And I want you to realize that and think about that when you see this scene this Christmas. I also want to direct your attention to one final component in the 
Christmas story. It's the manger. The manger. The little feed trough there where the baby Jesus was placed. That one looks pretty nice. It's got a blanket or a sheet there. The manger, this is uh, where the ordinary becomes the ordinary. That's the symbolism that I want you to see there. The manger is where the ordinary becomes the extraordinary. Don't think of the manger as a, a first century bassinet. This isn't an antique. I mean, when you look at that, it's not, uh, it's not something that you would see and say, you know what, uh, you know, I'd love to have one of those. This is a, a feed trough for animals. That's what it was. Um, just a feed trough for animals, crude, rude, rustic. Um, it was just a crudely constructed piece of farm furniture that was ordinary in every way. For most of us living in modern and contemporary society, the only reason you're even familiar with the term manger is because the Bible says God's son was laid in one. Without that, we wouldn't even really know what a manger was. Uh, apart from the, the passage of Scripture that talks about it and one particular Christmas carol, most of us wouldn't even have a clue. We wouldn't even have a clue to what a manger was. Never had any dealings with a manger. But because God's son was placed in a manger, look what happened to just an ordinary piece of farm furniture. Suddenly this thing has new dignity. This feed trough, it became a household word. The ordinary becomes extraordinary and a feed trough becomes the cradle of a king. That's what happened. Uh, this was quite a transformation, wouldn't you agree? I mean, in a way, the manger is this unique symbol of what can happen to any ordinary man or woman when Jesus Christ, through the power of his spirit, comes to reside on the inside. The manger is a symbol of what has happened to multiplied millions of people around the world and across the centuries who are just like you and me. A transformation has taken place in their life. Working people, thinking people, ordinary people, until one day they saw themselves for who they really were, sinners in the eyes of God. They saw themselves as sinners, and they admitted honestly that they were sinners in need of a Savior. And these ordinary people came to realize they couldn't change their past record, and they probably weren't going to do real well with their future record based on past conduct. I mean, they could tell, and, and things would probably remain about the same. They knew that they would be standing guilty before a holy God one day at judgment. And so their response was they fell on their knees in repentance. Just ordinary people saying, God, I see who I am. I acknowledge your holiness. I, I know that I've fallen short. I will never measure up on my own. And so they fell on their knees to cry out for mercy and grace and forgiveness undeniable mercy, amazing grace, ultimate forgiveness. They are only found through God's son, the Christmas child, whose purpose in coming was to take away the sins of the world. See, that's the point. That's what Christmas is all about. That's why Jesus came. That's why we're pointing people to him, because Jesus Christ came to take away the sins of the world. And that's why we fall on our knees to worship the Christ when, when we realize that salvation has come. That's why we can be grateful recipients of God's goodness and his amazing grace. We can be forgiven. The, sin of, the record of sin can be wiped away. We can be reconciled with God. All because, think of it, all because of a baby born in a manger, in a stable, 2,000 years ago. They were now adopted people, forgiven people, brought into the family of God as sons and daughters when they had realized who they were and they came to the source of their salvation. And see, when Jesus Christ takes up residency by his spirit in an ordinary life, the ordinary gives way to the extraordinary. And just as a feed trough becomes a king's cradle, a very average man or woman become exceptional in the eyes of God. And God does for us what Jesus did in that manger. He made something that was ordinary become extraordinary. That's what happens when Jesus comes to dwell inside of you. Wherever you go over these next few weeks, we're going to see these nativity scenes. And when you pass one in your car, as you see them on a billboard, as you look at them on a Christmas card, as you see them on television, as you look at the one on your mantle or there on the dining room table, I want to encourage you to think about the star. 
I mean, just you, you may see a star or you may just have to imagine the star because that one's a little bit more difficult to depict. But as you see that star, I want you to think about the fact that God provides travel guides for earnest seekers. Take a moment to thank God for the travel guides that he's placed in your life. Look around and see who those travel guides are today and go to them if you need help in finding your way to Christ this Christmas. And think about what it would mean for you to light the way for somebody else this Christmas season. See, uh, God provides travel guides for earnest seekers. And then as you look at the stable, don't forget that God decided not to shelter his son. Don't forget that Jesus came to the real world. God allowed him to experience all that he did so that he could identify with every single one of us, no matter what you're going through, no matter what's coming ahead. He understands better than you think. And over these next few weeks, I want you to look at the manger. And when you do, I want you to see how an ordinary piece of farm furniture got transformed into the cradle of a king. See, our, our choice this Christmas, it's, it's simple. We can just stand back and let another Christmas go by, kind of business as usual, following the routine, doing what we've always done, and, and let the nativity just kind of blend into the landscape. Or we can fall on our knees in repentance and then in worship of the Son of God, the Savior of the world, His name is Jesus. I want you to see there really is something to see in the nativity scene. And if you don't know what it means to experience the Christ of Christmas on a personal level today, I would love to pray for you that you would experience him on a first-hand basis because that's what Christmas is all about. Would you bow with me, please, as we pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your powerful presence. What an amazing thing to imagine that the Son of God, the creator of all that is, took on flesh, came to this earth in the form of a baby, a little, helpless, innocent, tiny baby. As we go about our business over these next few weeks, it'll be easy for us to miss it if we're not careful. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to just slow down and watch and listen and think about what it is that you have to say to us about the star, about the stable, about the manger. But most of all, Lord, I pray that you would help us to know what it means to know the Christ of Christmas, to know on a personal level what it means to humble ourselves before you in prayer, to repent of our sins, to invite you in as our Lord and Savior, not just the Savior of the world, but our personal Savior. And Lord, we give you thanks for loving us so much that you made a way. In Jesus' name, amen.